I'm back again for talk number two. This time, uh, Python packaging a zeitgeist. This is uh, an overview of the last roughly 18 to 24 months of development in the Python packaging world. Uh, just what's happened and what's going to happen. So first, a disclaimer. This list is not in chronological order. It is not in order of importance. It is not in any specific order except that which worked best for slides. But before we get to the, uh, the meat of this, let's just look at some fun statistics, because I think they're cool. So uh, in the month of April, uh, PyPI pushed 71 terabytes of data across 877 million requests. Those are really big numbers, and this makes me excited. Uh, not actually relevant to the rest of the talk, but big numbers are cool. So, <laughs> so let's move on uh, to some org chart changes in the Python packaging world. So the biggest one is the creation of a group called the Python Packaging Authority, or PyPA. So this is the group that is now responsible for all packaging stuff managed outside of the Python standard library. This includes pip, virtual env, and setup tools. Uh, they now have a central organization. They can all find each other relatively easily, and it means that more than one person has maintainership on all of those projects. Uh, we also have the, the new BDFL for packaging. So Guido has stepped back from dealing with packaging because as uh, Thomas mentioned, he doesn't really care about packaging particularly much. Uh, nothing against Guido, it's just not something that he really works with much. So he has designated Nick Coughlin as the BDFL delegate for packaging. That means that he can directly accept all PEPs related to packaging without discussion having to happen on the main Python dev lists. If anyone here is on Python dev, you'll understand why this is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, and if you're not, stay that way. Um, <laughs> additionally, Rich Jones uh, has uh, very fortunately come back and taken uh, a bit more of a center stage role in the development of PyPI, acting as the BDFL of PyPI itself, even though that lives a little bit outside of the formal CPython development framework, so there aren't always peps about it, but when there are, he can accept them. Uh, all right, so most of you probably use the Python package index at least at some point, either to host your own packages or more generally to find libraries to install or to install them. So we've made some changes to this. Uh, most importantly in my mind is security. So we've deployed TLS across all of PyPI. Uh, this is includes HTTPS. We now set the HTTP strict transport security headers, so you'll always use HTTPS, and we now support perfect forward secrecy on a reasonable subset of browsers. Uh, slightly older than some of the other stuff I'll mention, but mostly unknown, PyPI now offers a JSON API. If you take any package or version URL in PyPI and you just put slash JSON at the end, it will give you all of the data on that page in a very nice machine parsable JSON format. So if you're screen scraping PyPI, please stop. <laughs> Lots of people are, it's kind of annoying. Uh, fortunately, uh, another thing that we have added in the last uh, 18 months or so is Fastly. Fastly, as I mentioned in my last talk, is a caching CDN, and like I said, they are a very generous sponsor of the Python Software Foundation. Uh, so of those 80, uh, 877 million requests that I mentioned in that previous slide, only about 20% of those actually hit our servers. The rest are handled by Fastly's distributed network of caching servers. This means that we have much faster performance basically everywhere that isn't the US. Uh, and even within the US, we have a lot more stability. Uh, we also have an integrated static fallback system. So if there's ever any problems with the main PyPI servers, through Fastly, we can fail over to a static mirror in another data center that's updated every five minutes. So even if the main server is completely self-destruct, you'll never notice, uh, at least for PyPI or for, for pip install purposes. Um, this is very, very nice to have. Uh, the flip side of the CDN deployment is we mostly deprecated the mirroring system, so the, all of these public mirrors are now dead. The old A through G system um, have been completely removed and are no longer usable, and the mirror authenticity framework has been deprecated. So for the most part, the public mirroring system is not particularly stopped, but no longer really officially supported, uh, and PIP will no longer uh, attempt to use any public mirrors. Uh, but private mirrors, there have fortunately been some nice changes. So PEP 381 client was long the workhorse of building a PyPI mirror that's been largely retired in favor of a new tool called Bandersnatch. So if you do want to run an internal PyPI mirror, if you do a lot of uh, Python package installs from within your network, or if you just want to have extra safety in case we go down, even though, as mentioned, uh, fortunately that basically doesn't happen anymore, uh, Bandersnatch is a great tool to use and it's very easy to spin up a new Python package mirror. Also, DevPI, it's not strictly built for mirroring, but it can act as a read-through mirror. So if you don't want to mirror every package on, on the index, you can instead set up DevPI and have it set to cache only the stuff that you download through it. So that's very nice if you just want the subset of packages that you actually need at install time. 
We're also hard at work rebuilding the software that powers PyPI. The new tool is called Warehouse. Uh, it's an old, or it's an outgrowth of the old Crate.io website, which has since been retired. Uh, and you can use it now. Uh, it is available at warehouse.python.org. It will become PyPI 2.0, although not to worry, there'll be plenty of announcements before we flip it over. But if you have any scripts or other things that interact with PyPI, I would definitely encourage you to try them with Warehouse. We are aiming for almost 100% API compatibility, except for a few old things that we're pretty sure no one uses, but prove me wrong. Certainly let us know if there's any API that you're using. Uh, we would certainly like to know about all API compatibilities. Uh, right now it is mostly read-only, so you still have to do all your uploads through the old system, but you can test out anything that's, that's using the read APIs or the installation APIs. You can even just point pip at warehouse, uh, although there's not really much reason to. It should currently support all anything related to installation, search, and all of the JSON and XML RPC APIs. So what good is serving packages if you can't install them? So another uh, major area of security enhancement has been in PIP itself. So PIP, uh, now that PyPI offers good TLS support, PIP actually does TLS verification. So this means that you can't be man in the middle. Uh, we also have mostly deprecated external links and dependency links. Uh, dependency links have actually been removed. Uh, external links are still available, although I will touch on those a little bit more at the very end. But right now it requires a flag to activate external links is when you are hosting your files on an external server and just linking to them from PyPI. We've really been pushing people to actually upload all of their installation materials to PyPI itself so they can be covered by our nice, happy, uh, fastly caching system. We also now have uh, PEP 453, which is including PIP with the Python standard library. This means that finally, uh, after Python being around for 30 years, you can actually install packages out of the box with Python 3.4. Uh, yes, like this is, this is very, very big. Uh, we're still sorting out with all the distros of how exactly this will be handled. Uh, so it's not going to work exactly the same everywhere, but the expectation is if you install Python 3.4, you should have a working PIP. Uh, we also, as mentioned by Matthew, have wheels. Um, so I won't go into uh, quite as much detail as I did uh, the last time I gave this talk since we had that lovely lightning talk. But uh, I will mention there's still some issues with wheels. Um, he did briefly touch on the fact uh, we don't allow binary uploads to PyPI due to ABI compatibility issues. So if you want to do binary builds on Linux, you still have to do some of, your, some of the work yourself. Um, there's a tool called Wheelhouse, which makes it a little bit easier, but overall uh, it's still got to be uh, massaged a little bit. Uh, one of the great advantages of Wheels that he didn't touch on is you no longer need setup tools to install. If you are just using pip and you are installing wheel files, you don't need setup tools at all on the system. It is no longer a runtime dependency unless you specifically state that it is. This is very, very nice. Uh, it means that we can really hopefully one day relegate setup tools to be a build time requirement and not a runtime requirement of almost everything. And finally, on the installer side is Conda. Again, uh, this was fortunately already covered for the most part. Uh, I will mention uh, for people that are it now itching to try out Conda, uh, it does unfortunately have some lingering security issues. Most of them have been fixed in the last two weeks or so, but uh, as you might guess by the words security fixes in the last two weeks, it's still, it's still got some issues. Um, it is mostly aimed at the scientific and numeric computing worlds, so if you don't operate heavily within those worlds, I would still mostly recommend that you use PIP uh, on a daily basis. So once you have packages, you generally want to use them. So vEnv is the outgrowth of virtualenv. It works almost the same way, uh, albeit with a different name. Now instead of virtualenv, it's pyvenv, and it comes with Python itself as of 3.3. So again, once you install Python, you have a working packaging system, mostly. Uh, this is, again, quite nice. Uh, most people didn't really know much about distribute except for frustrating error messages and confusion, uh, but fortunately it's now completely gone. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, PJE helps to transition setup tools back to community management under the PyPA. So the old distribute fork has been merged back together with setup tools and now it's all just being done under setup tools. And similarly, distutils2 was briefly merged into the standard library during the 3.3 dev cycle and was then removed uh, and is now dead. So there is no distutils2, there will not be a distutils2 there is no parrot. Uh, and all of this wouldn't really matter without people making and releasing packages, so a few changes there. So the metadata spec uh, has been updated a little bit. Uh, it allows you to specify a lot of things that were added by setup tools as part of now standardized metadata so that other tools can interface with it. It's creatively named Metadata 2.0 and is being uh, discussed currently under PEP, 24, PEP 426, sorry. 
uh, all of this will now be in a single JSON file in a single well-recognized place, so it's a lot easier to build tools that integrate with the packaging ecosystem. Uh, uploaders are also very important. So most people upload their packages to PyPI by using Python setup.py something upload, but this has a lot of problems. Uh, mostly it can only upload packages that were built in that command line invocation. It means you can't do something like build a package and test a package and then upload the tested package. Um, this is fairly run of the mill for most packaging systems, but unfortunately distutil has never quite got there. Uh, fortunately there is now another tool available called Twine. Uh, you can use that to take an existing sdist or wheel file and upload it into PyPI. And on the uploads front, I'm probably doing myself a disservice by even mentioning it because most people never knew it existed, but PyPI SSH has been turned off. Uh, it was an old way to upload things over SSH that was used by, I think, at most 400 people ever. So uh, we have removed it. Uh, there will be an Another system added in the future if you don't want to deal with uploading via a password protected system. Um, we're hoping to offer TLS client certificates for authentication at some point in the future in warehouse. Uh, but until then, uh, Twine is your best bet. And finally, there's the Python Packaging User Guide, formerly known as the Hitchhiker's Guide to Packaging. It's the one-stop shop for all of the information you want about the packaging world. Uh, it's basically an expanded version of this talk. And I'd highly recommend you check it all out at packaging.python.org. And finally, a few coming soons. So what's on the horizon? So I mentioned Metadata 2.0 briefly as the new emerging standard for how to store metadata in Python packages. Uh, we've also got sdist and wheel 2.0 on the horizon. Both of those package formats have seen a little bit of wear and tear. Uh, as mentioned, wheels don't really work so great on Linux. sdists, the format hasn't really changed in years. So just trying to get those all updated, make sure they're compliant with Metadata 2.0 and that they're easy to install and to manage. Um, if you're interested in any of those, uh, check out the relevant PEPs. Again, Warehouse I mentioned before, uh, we are working to transition so that it will take over for PyPI for the old code base, uh, hopefully sometime in the next few months. And hot off the presses this morning is PEP 470. So I mentioned briefly before about external link scraping being deprecated. The goal of PEP 470 is to remove it entirely. So this will mean that PIP will just not consider scraping external links. Most people are not even aware that PIP does this. They assume that when you install something, it's coming from the package server, but it is in fact not always. PIP does currently support scraping external links and following to external servers just because you happen to link to them from your uh, PyPI description. So uh, we're trying to get rid of that. That will hopefully improve speed, stability, and security. And how would you uh, like to help us out with this? So the best places to contribute on the code side, uh, some stuff is hosted under Git, so pip, virtual engine, warehouse, <coughs> sorry, are all under the PyPA organization on GitHub, while setup tools, PyPI and wheel are under the PyPA organization on Bitbucket. No real reason for that, just things were set up in, in Mercurial versus Git as the original authors so desired. Uh, if you'd like to contribute to any of those, I highly recommend you check out their source code repos and uh, submit patches. There's also the PyPA channel on Freenode. If you have any questions about packaging in general or any of the projects that the PyPA team manages, that's the best place to go for help. Uh, and distutil sig is a mailing list. You can go sign up for it at list.python.org. It's the place where uh, all of the discussion on all of this happens. So if you're just interested in lurking or if you'd like to jump in and, and provide some opinions or feedback on any of the peps I've mentioned, that's the right place to check out. And thank you. And now questions round two. Uh, Can you say a little bit about how these different uh, uh, mega packaging tools that uh, uh, discover correct sets of dependencies to package together? Uh, which mega packaging tools do you mean like? Well, I mean, my, I mean, I mean like Wheel and Common. So Wheel is not, uh, Wheel is just a different uh, output format, it's basically the same idea as sdist, just a different organization of files. It doesn't package dependencies together. So a single wheel is a single package, and that's it. Uh, dependency management is all still handled via normal ways in pip. Um, Conda does it by, it, it puts together whatever you tell it to in the build scripts. Um, if you're talking about like building like groups of packages, that's more, that's more stuff like uh, the old virtual end bundling stuff, which is mostly deprecated at this point due to portability issues. So there's still an open problem. 
Uh, that's not really something we want to solve. That would be back towards my original talk, my, my first talk of tools like Omnibus. That is a mega package building framework uh, and works wonderfully, and I use it every day. Um, it works like uh, FreeBSD ports or Homebrew does, where you build descriptions of software and you state the, de the interdependencies, uh, and then it builds everything into a folder and slash opt and slams it through FPM and gives you a single package output. Super easy and makes really, really portable, gigantic packages with no external dependencies. Highly recommended. I've noticed recently that download counts on IPI seem to be all over the place. And that, like, does it, do you know why that is the case? Is, there, is it going to be fixed with Warehouse? Well, so no, it can't really be fixed. So those download counts are really the raw download counts that are coming off the Fastly streaming information. Uh, and it just means that somebody is downloading your package a whole lot, likely a mirror. Unfortunately, most of the mirrors don't self-identify, so we can't easily filter them out of those. Uh, there was actually a problem a few weeks ago where somebody Trump, somebody was trying to spin up an internal mirror at a tech company and accidentally was hitting us with, I think, 100,000 requests a second. Uh, needless to say, that inflates download counts a little bit. <laughs> So yeah, fortunately the download counts on PyPI are now all uh, time limited. So after a month, it won't matter, even if spikes like that do happen. So that's really the best we can do. Um, certainly we, we're, we do filter out Bandersnatch and as more and more people switch to that, instead of homespun mirroring frameworks, it will improve the quality there. Any other questions? I actually wanted to ask about Omnibus. Do you have any recommendation for resources to how to best do Omnibus? Because there's not a lot of documentation I've seen for Python and Omnibus. Uh, not a whole lot. So my best recommendation is check out uh, Omnibus Balanced. If you just search on GitHub, you'll find all of our Omnibus configs are open source, and you can just copy <coughs> us. Um, we're just building pretty boring Flask web apps. so. Just wanted to hold the microphone again. Um, did you could you say something uh, about how you're going to try and solve the Linux problem of, uh, of binary wheels for Linux? So I can say what <coughs> my opinion is, and I know Nick and I disagree about this, but it's my talk, so call dang it, I get to say my opinion. Uh, <laughs> Personally, I would like to see it just be opaque string based and only deal with stable AVIs like Linux distros so we can allow things like Ubuntu 12.04 as an ABI tag. Uh, it means that if you are using your own builds of stuff, that's not our problem anymore and you don't get any kind of ABI stability and you can't use public wheels, sorry. Uh, Nick has some other very interesting and I think overly complex ideas about uh, how to try to describe AVIs for existing systems. But personally, I would just I mean that that's, those are my, my big concerns is basically Ubuntu and CentOS for whatever like five versions of each I need to care about. Anybody else? All right. Thank you everybody for coming. If you have any other questions, find me afterwards.